This is David with Corel Trainer. This is Cassie Green from Apparelist. This is Gordon and Firemark from the Entertainment Law Update. And you're listening to Two Regular Guys Podcast. Hosted by Terry Combs RG, regular guy, and Aaron Montgomery. The place to be for industry news. The best dad jokes on earth, along with relevant topics to apparel decorating. So pass it away. <laughs> All right, welcome into the show. It is Friday, September 8th, 2023. I'm Terry Combs, and you can find me at terrycombs.com. And I'm Aaron Montgomery from Our Success Group, and uh, my mission is to inspire you to build a business that you love. Uh, Terry, I, I just also wanted to make sure everybody heard, I know you can't really hear him super clearly, but uh, Vic from Craft Express there at the end says, prepare for the wow. So are you prepared for the wow? <laughs> I'm prepared. Let's let's have a little wow. <laughs> let's have some wow. So speaking of wow, we've got uh, Mr. Charlie Dablieb joining us today, and he's going to share some trends, some tips, some takeaways, and uh, he's got 47 plus years in this industry. Terry, I, I think uh, he may uh, have you beat if, if, uh, if I'm doing my he, math correctly. He does. I'm, uh, I'm at 44 years. So oh, man, you're um, a rookie. Rookie. Just a pup compared to <laughs> Charlie's veteran status. <laughs> uh, and, and so we always love talking to Charlie. We've had an opportunity to have him on live broadcast. We've had him on the show before. He he keeps keeps cranking, keeps doing some cool stuff. He's got a new book. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So uh, going to be a great show today, Terry. I'm excited. I'm, I'm prepared for the wow. <laughs> Me too. Uh, everybody, make sure you stay till the very end also for your helping of the secret sauce. Uh, Eric Campbell's going to jump in. He's he's behind the scenes right now, but he's going to jump in and do his secret sauce on resizing embroidery designs. And so stay tuned till the end and let Eric cook. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get, let's get cooking. All right. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, um, we've got uh, we've got the new segment back here and uh, we are excited to have Cassie from the Apparelist joining us. And uh, she kind of the the last quote unquote man standing, so to speak right now, but uh, <laughs> uh, so a lot of she, shake ups going on out there. <laughs> yeah. A lot, a lot of shifting, a lot of things changing out there, but Hey, uh, you know, change is good, but uh, we, we've got uh, a rock steady Cassie and, and you're hopefully going to be seeing a lot more of her too. So we're super excited to have her here and um, always great news, but also just uh, really great delivery and, and the content that she's putting out over there at Apparelist is fantastic. So I think we've given her enough of a warm welcome, Terry. Can we, we drag her in here to do the news? Wait, let's jump in, Eric. All right. Good morning, everybody. And yes, thank you so much for that warm welcome, guys. Um, and Terry, I just wanted to tell you, don't feel bad. I only have 11 years in the industry. So <laughs> I am a true rookie, I feel like. Um, <laughs> All right, headlines this morning for everybody. Uh, uh, lots of feel good stuff going on in the industry. So first one, Charles River Apparel's Give Back program supports breast cancer research. So in August, Charles River Apparel introduced its River to Research program, which is their Give Back program dedicated to supporting the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, also known as BCRF. <clears throat> so from August 1st through October 31st, the company is donating 10% of the purchase price from select pink items for a minimum donation of 10,000 and a maximum donation of 20,000 to BCRF. Um, they selected BCRF because they have a lot of employees, um, personal connections, partners, customers, um, to, to people who have had breast cancer. So this is something that's very near and dear to all of their hearts. Um, the initiative itself targets breast cancer research, but Charles River has several other charitable causes it supports. Um, River to Research came about as part of the company drive to give back. It officially started its charitable program, Charles River Cares, in 2010. So really cool stuff they're doing over there. Second really neat story we have for you guys today is Big Frog of Raleigh North, officially certified as LGBT business enterprise. So I just want to clarify, LGBT is an actual, or LGBT business enterprise is an actual certifying body. Um, so they, Big Frog announced its recent certification as the LGBT business enterprise through the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce Supplier Diversity Initiative. 
Um, so Big Frog is now eligible to participate in the NGLCC's corporate partners supplier diversity programs. They can take advantage of the case educational opportunities promoted by NGLCC, and they can work to foster business to business relationships with other of um, this certifying entities um, worldwide businesses uh, throughout the year, um, which is really cool. So it just opens a lot of doors to great business growth opportunities um, for an underserved community. Third feel good headline for you guys today. I told you I had a lot of them. Grimco helps local community collect school supplies for students. So Grimco teamed up with a St. Louis, Missouri nonprofit to help students in that area um, through an initiative called Back to School Bonanza Book Drive. Grimco collected over 560 single books, more than 1,000 bo books in box sets, um, and then various items of clothing, such as like belts, for a total of $16,000 worth of items. That went to the Little Bit Foundation, which is a nonprofit committed to educational equity and removing barriers to learning. So really cool. Again, congratulations to all of those companies for doing such great work out in their communities. Final headline I have for you guys, and this is something I'm super excited about. We just announced inaugural apparelous forum at Printing United Expo will highlight evolving decorated apparel market. So the forum, which is sponsored by Cornet Digital, is designed for shop owners, production managers, and those in the printing industry interested in apparel decoration to network, discuss competitive advantages, nimble production, and more, um, with a particular emphasis on direct-to-garment printing technology. This will happen at the expo, and it is invite only. So you do need to click on that link um, and fill out an interest form. I will say, we didn't say this isn't just for apparel decorators. This is for everyone. So in the spirit of convergence, it's open to anyone of any print industry looking to just expand their business opportunities, find viable ways to grow their business. Um, it's a dialed in model that we've found success with through other brands like Implant Impressions and Printing Impressions. Um, so even though, again, it's invite only, I really encourage everybody to fill out an application form. Um, it's going to be a really fun event. So uh, that's my last headline and self-serving piece of the day. So back to you guys. I feel like we were invited. That's what that's what I heard. <laughs> I, I do feel like we're invited, and um, yeah, what a what a cool opportunity that is. So uh, I'm I'm definitely gonna go fill out that uh, invite form today to to get the official invite. You know, I think this was the encouragement here. <laughs> All right. I'm just well, gonna save that segment on the on my phone and show that at the door. <laughs> <laughs> see cassie said i could come <laughs> yeah. september I uh, what is it september 8th <laughs> <laughs> love it love it love it all right well speaking of uh people we uh, get to hang out with here today uh we've got some people checking in here terry we've got uh, kingsbury crafts good morning everyone we had uh, charles checking in as well chuck good morning to you michelle good morning uh we've got everybody tuning in we appreciate that Got to scroll down a little bit further here. We got Darren. Good morning to you. Eric, Eric could just pop him up. And I, yeah. <laughs> Rena, thank you, Rena. Uh, yeah, so scrolling and looking. The Jerry and uh, Kim Johnson, good morning. Thanks for being here, everybody. Um, if you guys would uh, take a quick moment to hear while we, uh, you know, you don't want to miss the dad joke, but maybe you can, um, you know, do a little uh, double duty, Terry. Maybe they can uh, share this show with their friends and listen into the dad joke. <laughs> I think that's uh, a good idea. You can listen while you uh, you're, you're texting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jer Jerry asked uh, what link is the invite. Eric is on it. Got it up there. Uh, it's the bit.ly forward slash pruaf two three. So don't. Don't read anything into the acronym there. All right. It's <laughs> totally rolling that in my head. <laughs> it's a perilous forum and not the other AF that people talk about. All right. <laughs> ah, well, so that was not the dad joke, by the way, folks. Terry has got a fantastic one for us today. Are you ready for that, sir? I'm ready. Let's, Let's do, do it. it.
All right, Aaron. Uh, did you know I picked up a hitchhiker last night? Uh, I did not know that, Terry. Yeah, the hitchhiker, he laughed and said, uh, how do you know I'm not a serial killer? And I said, the odds of two serial killers being in the same car are astronomical. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. Well, I will not be getting in a car with you anymore. Um... <laughs> I, I, I do have to confess, I've never, I haven't picked up a hitchhiker since sometime in the late 70s. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm not sure I've seen a hitchhiker since sometime in the late 70s, but I don't know. <laughs> uh... there... There were a lot of hippies with their thumb out when I was in college. So. Okay. All right. Well, maybe maybe Charlie's got a, 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 a story about that too. So we'll see. All right. Probably so. Probably All right. so. All right. <laughs> hey, before we jump in, uh, we want to thank everybody for checking out the Two Regular Guys podcast. Uh, we need your voices still. We, we, we have some, but uh, we would love to have the regulators participate in our show intros. And you guys have heard our new show intro. Go to decorators.ink, I-N-K, forward slash intro, and just read a few sentences, and uh, and you can be part of the show. We are always looking for new guests, so if you or anyone you know would like to join us, go to calendly.com forward slash two, the number two, regular guys, um, and to book your episode or email info at two, the number two, regular guys, with your show ideas. If you are listening to the podcast version of the show, we would appreciate you sharing the two regular guys guys podcast with all of your industry friends just like Aaron was just saying uh, so that you can so they can become regulators too and we would appreciate you giving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Podcast. You could go to all these places, YouTube Podcasts. Say. Go go everywhere and give us a review. <laughs> and wherever you do your podcast listening and if you're watching us live right now, please join in with your comments and your questions and and uh, I know many of you already know Charlie Tobleib, so uh, make sure that you come in with your comments and uh, and interact on the show today. Yeah, definitely. Looking forward to hearing from you guys, the regulators. So speaking of Charlie, are you uh, ready to bring him in here, Terry? Let's do. Let's see Charlie. All right. Let's, yeah, let's go ahead and bring Charlie in. Charlie, welcome into the show. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Hi, guys. It's wonderful to be here. And by the way, the last hitchhiker I think I picked up was in 1970s as well. <laughs> okay, all right, good. so it's confirmed. I think that's the last time I actually hitchhiked, but uh, I could, I could see you on hitchhiking, Charlie. Screen uh, under there, your there arm, are things that you just don't do anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. All right, well, Charlie, if somebody actually just started in the industry yesterday, that'd be about the only people I could think of that don't know who you are, but uh, just, just give us a little bit of uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, we won't need to cover the entire 47 years, but just kind of your right, journey in the industry real quick. You know, I got into this uh, by accident, just like a lot of other people. I, I was a graphic designer at ABC Network, uh, was doing the button for the Wings concert tour uh, in 1976. And I came up to see me as a friend of the family who had gotten into selling shirts on the street, bootlegging. And so he saw the design I was doing, asked if I could blow it up so that he could put it on a shirt, which I did. First one was a three-color design. By the way, I do have a second book that I'm almost done with that has all of this stuff in it. Has nothing technical, by the way. Uh, just stupid stories and things that we did back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. But in any event, um, I did the design for him. He came back a week later. I did another design. He said, you know, why don't, why don't we go into business together? You do the designing. I'll do the printing. Uh, lunchtime, jumped into his car, uh, drove from Manhattan to Brooklyn, rented 15,000 square feet, came back, uh, quit my job, went home and told my wife. And so that's how I got into the industry, <laughs> stupidly. Um, didn't even know what a press looked like. I, I was involved with the offset industry. And so to me, I, I couldn't figure out how a T-shirt went through all those rollers and came out the other end. Of course it didn't. But, um, you know, in 1976, this was a pretty raw industry. I mean, it was not the textile division was not only small, it was the smallest division in screen printing. And um, 10 years later, not only were we big, we were bigger than all the other divisions put together. So we had grown a huge amount. And of course, Terry, I know you were in it by that point. Uh, yeah. It was it was an interesting time. You know, it was fun. Uh, there was a lot more camaraderie, I think, at that time. Uh, people were definitely willing to share 
how they did things and um, explain them to a point of really being very friendly. Uh, you never worried about your competition for the most part um, because you had to rely on your competitors to get ink from them periodically because supply houses weren't quite uh, as um, available as they are today. So uh, it was a different time. It was fun. But um, as far as someone getting into the industry, so the pandemic hit, which, of course, we were all affected by. I normally travel about 200 days a year. Uh, I came back from Egypt on March 4th of 2020 and didn't do an out-of-country show until May of 2023. Yeah. So long time. Uh, and really didn't do any shows in the U.S. because everybody canceled all their shows. So, you know, when you sit home and um, your wife finds things for you to do every day of the of, of the week, uh, you get to the point of like, I I need to do something. I need to <laughs> I need to put myself in a position of not being available to do all of this stuff. Um, so I started going through a bunch of the articles and technical uh, papers that I had written. Uh, some of the consulting work I had done and um, decided to put into a book format. That's and so, uh, I don't know, probably spent off and on two years putting it together um, and ended up with a heck of a lot more than I thought. I mean, it's 260 pages cover to cover, which I never thought I'd write in my life. I mean, I was one of those guys who took English in college and got a C and, and was dancing in the streets because I wouldn't have to take another English class. <laughs> uh, then again, I did the same thing in speech. I got a C and I thought that was the end of the world, man. I don't, I'll never have to get in front of an audience again. <laughs> of course, all three of us do exactly that. We all write and we all speak. Um, right. Funny how life kind of has that little twist uh, <laughs> of things that you would never think you were going to do. And yet um, that's what we do for a living. Yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible. You, you know, Charlie, when you, it, it's funny you say that about, uh, about the early days, because it's just, just recently I was thinking about the seventies, early eighties, that was like the golden age of screen printing, you know, <laughs> and, uh, people were getting involved in it. Uh, uh, nobody really knew much about it. And, and, uh, Charlie, you'll recall this, the, the seminars at like impressions expo and, and uh, as back then, SGIA, there, there'd be 150, 200 people in a seminar room. And and it, like when I started out, I would go from seminar to seminar and just write notes and notes. So uh, when, Charlie, when and where did you speak at your first trade show? And, and, and how did that, you know, you're talking about being in speech class. How, how did that uh, speaking shape your approach to uh, how you share with the industry so the first time i actually got to speak was at a technical symposium in pittsburgh in 1980 and um i was a speaker that was going to talk about multicolor printing on dark shirts and i had heard that people were coming to shoot down the way in which i said i i did my separations and did my printing and so what i did was i printed up about 350 king tut pieces on black pelon and so as you came in you were handed one of these um it became my turn to speak and the person in front of me had gone overtime which i was thrilled about and i said you know not a problem i'll cut mine short <laughs> and so uh, i cut mine down to about 15 minutes how anyone ever heard me i'm not sure because my teeth were banging together so hard that i couldn't <laughs> hear myself i mean i was petrified because there were about 300 people in the room. Yeah. Um, finished my song and dance. And gee, nobody had any questions about shooting me down and telling me that it didn't work because they were holding the results in the hand. So um, for me, that was good. Based on that, I started speaking at some of the uh, ISS shows. Um, Vern Packer was really the person who was probably more responsible for it. And in 1986, he actually asked me to uh, put together a, a three, two and a half day workshop. And so it was going to be a standalone workshop. I was going to do screen print. Mark Bennett was going to do merchant uh, marketing and Greg and Barbara Camaro were going to do embroidery. And so the first one was held in uh, Atlantic city 
And here we are walking through the casino with dryers, with presses, with washout booths. Uh, we set up an entire shop there. Wow. Uh, it, it was pretty interesting, actually. Um, we did that one. We did one in Atlanta. We did one in Reno. And then they attached it to the show. And so that's when the uh, workshops actually did start internally. Yeah. Uh, I really have to admit, I don't remember the exact first time I spoke at a show. But, you know, you were talking about crowds. I remember doing one in uh, St. Louis. And we had been out the night before. We were so drunk. It was amazing. <laughs> um, I'm with my client in the morning. I'm still drunk. They're they're eating breakfast. I'm hungover. <laughs> and one of them says to me, uh, aren't you supposed to be doing a seminar? It's like I looked at my watch. It's like, yeah, it started five minutes ago. So I ran across the street to the convention center. And as I came through the door, I hear John Crawford announcing to Scott Fresner, Scott Fresner, would you take over the seminar for Charlie Tavley? We can't find him. <laughs> <laughs> I get to my room. And, you know, they have those partitions at convention centers so they can open up a room. Yeah. yeah. Well, they opened up one, then they opened up another, then they opened another. They had 500 people waiting for me. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah. this, this is insane. Uh, the official count came out to 350 because they ran out of tickets. Um, and I'm, sh I'm holding up. My lips are stuck together because I'm drunk. <laughs> and I'm holding up a T-shirt. And I'm thinking the guy in the back, if he had binoculars, couldn't tell what I was doing. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, the crowds were amazing back then. I mean, when you only had 100 people show up, you kind of felt like you were losing out on something. Wow. <laughs> it's, it was a different world back in those days. Oh, yeah. and, you, and you know, Charlie, uh, Mark Vinnett, you, I don't know if you've ever heard, that's where we got our show name. Because the first time I spoke was in 1991 in Dallas. <laughs> Uh, and and it was with Mark. I'd never met him before, and uh, and he went up and introduced himself. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, my name is Mark Bennett, MBA. And uh, as you <laughs> can call him saying that, because <laughs> he always did. And I walked up and said, "Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Combs, RG, regular guy." <laughs> <laughs> In Terry's usual smartass way. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> uh, Bennett was an interesting guy. I, yeah, he's really missed. That's too bad. But yeah, yeah it goes yeah. on. But in any event, um, so I put together my book. Ta -da, ta -da. There it is. And, In fact, speaking uh, of that, really, uh, I put it together Eric in a way put, that. Yeah, we've know, got the I'm link right to, there. If you want to go check it out, everybody, oh, there on the screen. Yep. Tried to put it together in a way that um, really went through the process from art to uh, to screen to production to some of the stupid things, uh, dipping and rolling shirts, um, cutting them apart, making them into beach cover-ups, things that uh, most people just don't want to bother with for the most part, but are curious about. So it's very technical in certain aspects, but then it also gets into some of the more fun things, I think. Um, Things that keep coming back, you know, I had to do a tie-dye shirt in uh, 30 seconds versus 15 minutes, and you don't have to get stoned to do it. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a great chapter. <laughs> you know, Charlie, uh, I, I uh, I'll always laugh. Uh, when I come into a seminar room to speak, I can always tell if you've been there ahead of me because there's like spray cans and there's this like <laughs> rumpled up paper that you've used to do some technique with and I have to kind of clean up and then, <laughs> and then do well, my you know, The reason I, I run out of things to, to say, so I, I need to do something in order to occupy the rest of the time. So uh, <laughs> doing sprays and, and uh, things of that nature. You know, it's funny uh, when you start doing these things, how, how you amaze people with a simple black spray can and what you can do with it. And, and I, I I don't think that um, screen printers for the most part think out of the box enough. Yeah. And yeah. and it's one of those simple things, you know, a, a $2 can of spray paint and a, a light colored shirt and boom, you've got a quote unquote a tie dye look that you can put a screen print over the top of and not only make extra money, but separate yourself from the crowd. And I think that's really the big thing is how do I get myself away from the day-to-day -day competitors that I have? And what do I have to do in order to make that extra money? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Really good insight there. 
For sure. So um, Bill Luber said earlier, huh, a book of Charlie's uh, stupid stories actually sounds like a great read. So uh, keep keep working on that one, Charlie. We need to see that one. Almost and done. Then, and and uh, I'll send you guys copies so that you can review it for me and tell me how stupid some of them are. But that's all right. <laughs> oh, it's going to be awesome. Um, and then Jerry Dyke says, uh, I was in one of Charlie's seminars back in the day. And she also mentioned that uh, Mark Bennett helped uh, – them name their business so uh he's been involved in lots of namings apparently <laughs> you know that was one of the big things with mark uh he loved to come into a company and change that name that was his big thing and uh, i'm not sure why but i guess he had to put his uh, little mark on everything that he did <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's a fun little story. All right. Well, so we've been talking a little bit about some of the speaking and things like that. And uh, next week, uh, you will be out at uh, the Fort Worth Impressions Expo along with the two regular guys crew here. But uh, what, what are you talking about next week? So I'm doing a basic workshop, which uh, I do a lot of. Um, I know, Terry, you're involved heavily with that type of stuff as well. Um, love doing the basic one because... You know, we have so many people coming into the industry and there's so much bad information online. There's some really good stuff, but there's so much bad. And, and that, and uh, I try to tell people, you know, if you're going to watch YouTube, if you don't know who it is that's online and you don't know what their credentials are, do not watch it. There's too much bad stuff that they're putting out there. Um, it, it has to be somebody that is credible. Nothing against a garage operation, but when you when some guy is standing in his garage and is going to tell me how I can grow my business, why do I have a problem with that? You know, um, <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, to me, doing a basic seminar or a workshop is really an important thing. I think I think it's really something that the industry needs to stay focused on, uh, whether it's me or somebody else doing it. But they really need to make sure that the information that's being passed on is really valid. Yeah. Um, that it's usable. It's not a commercial um, situation. It's a uh, informative situation. So I'm doing that one. I'm doing three seminars. I think I'm doing uh, a special effects one, nice. which uh, for next year, I'm actually going to be doing a basic and a special effects workshop at the um, Impressions Expo in January and in April. Uh, it seems that special effects are starting to come back again. Okay. And they go through cycles. Um, you know, the amount of questioning that I get on Puff is um, pretty interesting to me because Puff was one of those things I thought would never come back. Uh, you know, with all the high density inks and all of the other special effects things, blister base, et cetera, never thought Puff would come back, but here it is. And um, getting questions on that. Some people are really interested in thermochromatic and photochromatic. I, I think they're interested until they hear the price point. You know, you're looking at about a $500 a gallon ink, and um, that's enough to scare you off. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it, it's one of those inks that are kind of fun, but really has limited use, I think, because uh, you got to print on white shirts, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of expect high density to come back a bit. Um, I'm hoping that glitter doesn't. You know, it's one of those where uh, you're working with glitter and, and you look like you just came out of a strip club. Um, and, and it's difficult to explain to someone, no, I really didn't go there. Uh, I've gotten too old for that. But, <laughs> you, you know, Charlie, it's uh, it's funny, too. And, and you know, you, we, we've both been in this game a long time and we both teach and uh, I'll have somebody say, hey, do you know anything about that new discharge ink? And I'll be yeah. like, I, I, I know about discharge ink <laughs> because yes. it's, it comes and it goes and it comes <laughs> and it goes. You know, I think most people don't realize that it's been around for probably over 100 years. <laughs> yeah, I used to use it back in the 70s. Oh, me too. Me too. And, absolutely. You know, it, it was actually used in rotary screen printing for, for uh, drapery fabrics way back in the day, long before we were around. But yeah, um, well, you know, and and with sublimation, I, I used to screen print sublimation transfers all the time to go on to trucker hats. The first yeah. time trucker hats were really big. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, everything goes through a cycle, it seems, and. Um, 
you know, sublimation has been around a long time. Of course, it's it's certainly gotten far more perfected nowadays and oh, it's yeah. certainly more vibrant, uh, but it's been around. Uh, there are really that, not that many things that are that new anymore. They just keep getting rediscovered. Exactly and, right. Um, you know, I, I think as an industry, we're quite inventive. So we'll take something that was done a while back, but we'll put a twist on it and then go forward. So glow in the dark is one of those things that people are going after again. Uh, the standard green was where everybody was, but then you have Velour Glow out in California who's doing all kinds of colors and stuff. And mm -hmm. stuff works really, really beautifully, um, which is kind of exciting. You know, and then the question is, do you put a base down and put the ink on top of it? Do you put the ink directly on a shirt? Do you put it over the top of a color? And the answer to all of those is yes, yes, and yes, but you're going to get different finishes. Uh, you, you know, I, uh, Charlie, I always tell people, uh, once you buy your first container of phosphorescent uh, powder to, to mix with clear base to do uh, glow in the dark, that'll probably be your lifetime supply because you're going to do that one order and then it's going to sit there on your shelf. <laughs> yeah, it probably will. You know, what I find interesting is I'll go into a shop and say, hey, have you ever done high density? It's like, no, my customers never asked for it. It's like, you really expect your customer to know what it is? You know, uh, as a as a printer, in order to get certain jobs, you need to do uh, samples. You need to put it out there. You need to stick it under your customer's nose and say, hey, we can do this for you. Um, yeah. As opposed to waiting for them to ask you if you do something. And I, I, I find with a lot of the newer printers, especially, they're waiting for their customer as opposed to them going out and doing marketing. Yeah. And those who do marketing do very, very well, because even if you don't sell them on that, the fact that you could do it puts you a leg up on your competitor. Right. And it shows that you are that you're a professional and, and, and you you uh, have have those creative skills. Hey, Charlie, let's put you on hold for just a minute and uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back to talk about your book. Terrific. Are you feeling stuck in your journey? Have you made investments in programs or put time into your business and can't seem to get there fast enough? Don't go it alone. Take a look at Radical Goal Getters and unlock what you've been missing. Radical Goal Getters is a facilitated six-month mastermind program designed by Success Principles trainers who have led masterminds for Mr. Jack Canfield. These cohorts are your ticket to success in just six months. It's not just another program or training class. It will become your success community. This specific proven concept is the support, accountability, and expert guidance you need to break through barriers. Visit RadicalGoalGetters.com to learn more and apply for your life-changing opportunity. New mastermind groups are now forming. Imagine achieving your number one goal, being truly fulfilled, all while being surrounded by like-minded peers who cheer you on every step of the way. That's the Radical Goal Getters difference. All you have to do is apply at RadicalGoalGetters.com today. All right, you guys, check that out. I appreciate you uh, seeing if Radical Goal Getters might be right for you. Charlie, um, before we keep going here, I do want to just the regulators that are tuned in live, this is your opportunity. You've got a gentleman here with uh, nearly 50 years of experience that uh, we can get more out of. But you already gave us a little bit of a sneak peek of the book there. In fact, if you still have it handy, you want to hold it up one more time sure. for everybody to see. And, and what's the title of it? There you go. This so it's a screen printer's handbook and survival guide. Wonderful. I love and, the cover. Uh, actually, Dane did the back cover for me. So oh, that's <laughs> super cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I actually Dane is helping me with my cover right now, too. So that, that Dane I, I actually cool. have a 3D of that, but it says um, Mr. Screen. And so he got rid of the Mr. Screen and put in the Dr. Print. But uh, it's a 3D uh, foam thing. Um, one of the ex-presidents of, of FESPA got into doing sign making and stuff. Hmm. And so he did that at one of the shows and gave it to me. And so it hangs in my office, which, you know, we all pick up these stupid memorabilia type things, right? Yeah. And so I've had it in my office for a long time, which I love. But, you know, Mr. Screen just didn't do it for me. So uh, Dane went in and changed it so it read Mr. Dr. Print, Dr. which Print. Uh, is what my email addresses 
Yeah. Right. Yep. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Dr. Pratt. Well, okay. So you've told us a little bit about the book already, but, but give us a little bit more kind of what, what are some of the takeaways that people are going to have after they read that? What can they kind of expect to find in so, there? Um, so I have a, a fair amount of documentation forms and I, I find that uh, I go into shops and um, they can do a good job of making your job look good the first time. They don't know how to duplicate it. And so I've taken a lot of that information um, from people like Andy Anderson and some of the others in the industry. And I've actually formulated this over a number of years. So I have a pretty heavy duty uh, documentation form, um, wash tests, uh, things that people don't even do anymore. Years ago, Wilflex came out with a book on doing all kinds of stuff in screen printing, including uh, using cellosol of acetate to check for cure, which is what most people don't know anything about. Right. Uh, so I've put that in there. Um, things on doing an incentive program. Um, besides all the technical stuff, which I think is certainly the heart of the book, and, and it's geared to um, not only the beginner, but even a shop that's been going on for quite a few years that needs to sharpen up some skills. So if you're hiring a screen person, um, how to apply capillary film correctly in terms of high density, a mm. um, couple of different ways of doing it. Um, but it really a bunch of forms uh, for everything from the art department to uh, documenting uh, your exposure times, what the emulsion is that you're working with, mesh counts, uh, going through what, what you need to know about mesh counts not only the mesh count, but also the thread diameter, why the importance of that. Um, the types of things that, you know, uh, certainly Terry and I would be doing in workshops is trying to um, give them a, a well-rounded background so that there aren't too many questions left for them that, as they work their way through the book. So it's available as a download, which I think is, you know, fairly inexpensive in that sense. And also as a spiral version, which is my favorite because you can open it up and leave it there and really read what's going on. Um, you know, uh, awesome. I've, I've broken it into a variety of chapters of printing anything from how to print an umbrella, which most people wouldn't know how to do, to, you know, printing jackets, which thank God we don't have to do too much of anymore. But, um, <laughs> you know, every once in a while somebody gets – uh, to the point where they really want a jacket printed. Why? I have no idea, but they do. Uh, <laughs> the umbrella pot, I actually think is pretty cool myself. Uh, when yeah. we did it, which was years ago, um, we decorated every other panel on it on an umbrella, and it came out absolutely dead perfect. It was such a simple operation, and yet most people don't know what to do with it. Or where yeah. to start. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know, Charlie, I, I saw somebody uh, just this past week wearing a pink satin jacket, and I had just this flashback to the 70s. Uh, <laughs> I used to print those all the time. <laughs> I, you know, uh, the difficulties back in the day of printing a jacket are something that most people will never understand. Right. <laughs> uh, between getting rid of the water repellents and the pre-flash and uh, praying that the ink stays on. Uh, you know, and of course, you hit a, a jacket from China, and no matter what you do, nothing is holding on to it. So you've got to embroider that one. But uh, those are all things that uh, we did go through on a regular basis back in those days, which today everybody just embroiders hats and jackets. Well, that's great. And certainly Eric gets a kick out of that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. you know, back in the day, we had to print everything. Uh, yeah. Matter of yeah, fact, exactly in my right. second book, I'm standing next to a sailboat sale because we're the type of company that never said no. And so uh, had a company come to us and wanted us to print their sailboat sales. And it was like, yeah, we could do that. And then, of course, you say yes. And then you have to go back and figure out how in the hell do you do this thing? Uh, fortunately, <laughs> we had the 100, we had 100 foot long tables. And so laying out a sailboat sale on a table was not that big an issue for us. But um, it was interesting. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, Charlie, um, uh, all of us that know you know that your summer road trips are, are kind of legendary. So uh, I, I assume you're back at it. Can you share some highlights from 2023? Did you meet any interesting people, uh, some, some cool shops out there? 
Well, 2023 was definitely an interesting one for me. So uh, I've broken into two parts. First part was eight days long. Second part was 13 days long. And um, so my first, I left Denver and headed to South Dakota, to Aberdeen. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Aberdeen, but Aberdeen has uh, four screen printers. I've done, I've done consulting work for three of them, which is <laughs> always an interesting thing. Uh, long ride, came down with a case of sciatica, or oh. what I thought was sciatica. And so um, saw the people up in Aberdeen, really nice shop. Uh, my favorite shop is up in uh, North Dakota, up in Grand Forks. Um, spent some time with them. You know, I, I think the, the fun part about being on a road trip is you really get a chance to see this country. I don't think enough people have actually traveled the country. I mean, I've hit all 50 states way, way back, uh, but some of them I flew into as opposed to driving into. And so on my road trip this year, I normally do an East Coast swing, but I only had one company really on the East Coast, which was in Ohio, so not too bad. So on my first eight-day trip, I um, hit um, South Dakota, North Dakota, South Dakota again, Iowa, and then home. Uh, on my second part, I was in Missouri, uh, Ohio, Indiana, et cetera, um, put on 6,400 miles in three weeks, which um, was a little excessive, I think. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to see the pain doctor this afternoon to get a shot, because as it turned out, I don't have sciatica. Uh, I have a disc that swelled and stuff, and so I have a pinched nerve uh, from that wonderful road trip. But um, I think the, the fun oh part gosh. of being on a road trip is you get, uh, for me, um, almost every company that I saw were companies that I saw through the DAX show as opposed to the ISS shows. And so DAX shows, which I love doing, um, I call it my farmers and ranchers show because these are people that will never go to one of the major shows. Right. Um, and are they really farmers and ranchers? And the answer is, yeah, they really are. I mean, I know you guys are at the shows as well. It's a show where you get to actually spend a lot of time with people if you want to, and nobody is really waiting to see you. Uh, where at an ISS show, you know, you've got a certain amount of time you can spend with someone and you got to move on. Um, right. Spend some time down in lower, what's it, southwestern Missouri. I actually stayed in a casino in Oklahoma, which was wonderful. Um, just really nice people. Uh, a couple of them just got into automatics, which was kind of fun. Uh, you know, kind of guiding them on day one rather than uh, having them make a bunch of mistakes, uh, which I think a lot of people, I think you have to make mistakes in order to correct them, but you don't have to make every mistake, uh, mistake in the book in order to uh, move forward. And so yeah. a little bit of push and shove, a little bit of guidance and, uh, you know, a little bit of push on how to get better detail how to get a uh, softer hand, especially on, on an automatic, was certainly a, a part of it. But um, all the companies I went to see were very receptive, which is kind of nice, including all their employees. You know, I, I don't know about you, Terry, but I always get this thing before I go into some shops, like, you're not going to get along with my art director. They really don't want you here. And then, of course, you go <laughs> in yes, and start dealing with them. And you realize, you know what, I don't have a problem. I don't want that job. So I'm not a threat to them, you know, but initially, of course, the, the reaction is, am I not doing a good enough job that you have to bring somebody else in? And the answer is it has nothing to do with you doing a good enough job. You're, you're only able to see certain things where somebody coming in from the outside has fresh eyes and can just do a little bit of tweaking that's going to make everybody's life easier. And I'm sure you guys have gone through some of that as well, where you come into a shop and they're not doing a bad job, but they could do a little bit nicer job. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's the biggest thing about consulting is um, there's a certain fear factor by the employees of you're going to tell me I'm doing everything wrong. And the answer is, no, I'm never going to tell you that you're doing it wrong, but I will be happy to tell you how you might do it a little better. Don't want to take advice. That's fine, too. You know, like I tell them, I get paid whether you listen or not. So, uh, you know, that is my deal. Yeah. I, and do I do it for the money? You know, money is certainly a factor, but 
you don't put 47 years into an industry because you don't love it. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. You, you so, know, Charlie, you were back home in Oklahoma. I remember you telling me one time that uh, you were a New York City boy going to college in Oklahoma. I did. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, so I spent two years in Alva, Oklahoma. And last summer, I got invited to do a shop in Enid, Oklahoma. I said, Enid, we used to date the girls out of Enid because the girls <laughs> in Alva were not allowed to da date Yankees. So this is going back to 1967 or so. And so um, while I was working in Enid, I decided to take a ride up to my old school up in Alva, which is now part of, um, what's it, uh, Oklahoma State University has kind of taken them in. But um, and the campus has definitely grown. Uh, unfortunately, I was there between terms, so I didn't get to see any real people there. But uh, driving through the town was weird. So the two places that are still there, the bowling alley and the Sonic. So Sonic <laughs> is where we would have Hell Night because I did join a, a fraternity. A fraternity, yeah. <laughs> and so the only thing they did with the Sonic is they updated the signage so that it's electronic. But other than that, it's the same as it was 50 years ago. <laughs> but yeah, I, I got, uh, um, I had a friend who uh, went out to Oklahoma and called me up and said, hey, why don't you come to school out here? And I said, well, what do I got to do? He said, well, you got to apply. So I applied, I got accepted. I went across the street to my friend, Rob. I said, you want to come to Oklahoma with me? He said, well, what do I got to do? Well, you got to apply. So he applied. And <laughs> And the two of us flew into Oklahoma City, and uh, as I got off the plane, I'm looking around thinking, oh, my God, the rodeo's in town because everybody's got cowboy hats and cowboy boots on. <laughs> Listen, I was a Yankee from, from Brooklyn, you know, and so uh, what do I know about rodeos? It's obviously, the rodeo was not in town. Um, what's funny is we never went back to Oklahoma City until I went to Enid because we would fly in and out of Wichita, Kansas. Right. And uh, right. we would take the railroad from Alva to Wichita. And it was so old that we were waiting for the Indians to attack us because <laughs> there's no question that they would. I mean, it was really that old the rail line. But uh, I spent two years in Oklahoma and then I decided I needed to move on. So I moved up to uh, western Michigan up in Kalamazoo. But um, I actually love my time in, in Oklahoma. I mean, we would go to the Alabaster Caves. It was the first time in my life I remember going alone, and I did a 360, and there was not one sign of humanity. Where growing up in New York, it was an impossible thing. There, no, there is no such thing as getting away from it. I don't care if you drive to upstate New York, you're going to still find telephone lines and stuff like that. Oklahoma. So my favorite, there was a town called Hart uh, Avard. So we would drive to Avard just for one reason. They, they had the crank up phone. So we'd get on and if Mabel, can you connect me? <laughs> it, was, it was just one of those things where, you know, you tell someone that you've used a crank up phone and it's like, really, you did? And it's like, yeah, this town was probably, a, you know, a population of 45. And yeah. um, they had an operator who would connect you. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. Cool. Very cool. All right. Um, Kristen says, uh, I took one of Charlie's extended seminars at Dax many years ago. He's a fantastic instructor. Yeah, we, we agree with that. All right. Well, Charlie, we've got, uh, unfortunately, only a limited amount of time because we could just do this all day. We're going to read it in your book coming up soon anyhow, but uh, <laughs> so hopefully uh, we get there. But, you know, with 47 years, you know, you've seen the industry evolve and change. And so today, what, what kind of shifts are you seeing? What have you observed that maybe, you know, a newcomer might not be aware of or maybe even established professionals? You know, again, what, what, what are people missing out there when it comes to trends? You know, I, I think the biggest thing that I see is um, they're relying on old technology. So you still hear of them using 110 and 156 as an underlay, uh, 156 on top. Um, a lot of flashing. I mean, when I started out, the flash unit hadn't been invented. And we were doing six and eight color work on black shirts without a flash because we figured out how to do it. And uh, today, everybody wants to have you hand it to them, which I understand. And there's no reason to, to not expect that if you go into a workshop or a seminar. But you still have to do some experimenting. But at the same time, back in my early days, all you had to do is make the shirt look vibrant and it would sell. Today, it has to be vibrant. It has to be soft. 
Uh, it has to be sharp. It has to have all of those characteristics that uh, I think a lot of, especially the shops that have been around for a long time, rely on old technology. And, you know, I, I go into a shop and I'll, especially on an automatic, I'll push them to use it 305 as an underlay and 305 for their colors. And will it work? Yes, it does. Uh, you do have to tweak your artwork a bit, which is fine. Uh, you do have to understand that you need proper inks. But uh, your, your customers today are looking for things that are soft and vibrant and, and learning how to print on different fabrics. You know, tri-blends, when I first did testing for one of the companies on tri-blends, my recommendation was to embroider the damn things. I mean, they were <laughs> brutal. Uh, and they still are. They still create a lot of issues. But, you know, we've learned certain things about them in terms of preheating your palettes to a certain degree so that um, you don't have to flash as long so you don't shrink your garment. Um, there, there are definitely things out there that you can do to make things happen better, uh, faster. Um, the whole idea of uh, setting up a job, how long should it take? You know, honestly, you know, five, six color job, if you're not done within a half hour, you're, you're way out of tune. And should it be even faster than that? It should, but, you know, you allow a half hour. I mean, I'll go into shops and they're spending two hours, two and a half hours trying to register a job. Wow. Yeah. Maybe you need to look at your artwork and redo your artwork so that your production people aren't struggling. Yeah. You know, it, it, it isn't just production. It starts in the art department. And, of course, you know, to me, my favorite area is still the screen department. I think it's the most abused area in every shop. And so um, choosing the correct mesh, choosing the correct color order, choosing the correct inks, that's all part of the package. Um, but then getting on press, the squeegee is probably the one most overlooked thing in, in every screen, screen shop. You know, I'll go over to someone and, and say, you know, why are you using that particular squeegee? Oh, because it was clean. It's like... <laughs> You know, it's an 80 durometer brick and, and you're trying to print a black shirt with it yeah. uh, and you're not getting any ink. Gee, what a shock. Um, <laughs> you know, not only that, you know, you go into a shop, they have automatics. You ask them if they have a squeegee sharpener and they look at you like you're from out of space. Um, no, we'll just change the blades. Well, good. You should be changing them every 10,000 prints, which in your shop means you're going to be changing them every week to two weeks. I want to sell you your squeegees. Um, yeah, really. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's the little things that change those. I, I was talking to Andy Anderson, who I think is the best printer in the U.S. And, and so in my form, I have all of this uh, documentation. And I, I was talking to him and he said, uh, you know, before I did every four color process job, I would shop in my squeegees. It's like really for every job, yep, for absolutely every four color process job, he would sharpen a squeegee. So this way he was able to be consistent. And I, I mean, I have shirts that he did where I have shirt one and then shirt whatever it is that came 10 years later and you put the two together and they look identical. Yeah. Um, and it's because he knows how to document and did document absolutely everything about it. And so now I have to add that into my form, which is driving me out of my mind, but that's beside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sharp and squeegee. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, um, I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, when you do a seminar or workshop or you do a consulting job is trying to get them to understand why you want to make certain changes in that shop that will benefit them. And of course, the first thing they say is, you know how much that's going to cost? And it's like, do you know what it's costing you now by not having it? Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, um, uh, Unfortunately, with a lot of owners, they're front office people as opposed to back end people. And so they look at it from the side that we don't. You know, they'll hire a um, consultant for the front, uh, even though they have a, a bachelor's degree in, in business. And it's like, well, I hire him because I don't get to see everything. I said, well, what about the guy in the back? It's well, I have a production manager back there. Uh-huh. So you're going to hire someone up front because... You have a degree, but you won't hire someone in the back because you have a production manager. Well, that makes all the sense in the world. By the way, where do you make your money, up front or in the back? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. Wow. But well, of course, you have, you have to be very um, 
diplomatic about how you present it. I think that's the one thing I, I've worked on over the years is how to not piss someone off. <laughs> Although I think sometimes it's good to do that, but never less. <laughs> well, I could we could chat all day long about all this. We're we are coming to the end of our hour, and uh, and I so I I'll be seeing you in the in the speakers lounge here in Fort Worth here <laughs> in about a week or so. But yeah. Charlie, where can our listeners find you? Where can they buy your book? Uh, where can they learn more about your consulting services? So uh, all of that is on my website, which is taubleibconsulting.com. So uh, my book, um, I, I do post the uh, workshops and seminars that I'm going to do on Facebook and on LinkedIn. And on LinkedIn. Um, my email address is drprint at AOL.com. Everybody says, really, you still have an AOL address? Yep, I still do. <laughs> uh, so it's drprint at AOL.com. Uh, my phone number is 303 you want to text me, call me. I have no problem. I'd be happy to set up a short Zoom session to chit chat about whatever your needs are. Um, but even my consulting, everything is listed on my webpage, pricing, everything. Perfect. So, and wonderful. it's always wonderful to see you guys. I definitely look forward to seeing you in Fort Worth. I happen to love the Fort Worth show. I think it's one of the uh, better shows in terms of being able to kick around town and bump into everybody from the show, which I love. Yeah, exactly. definitely. Exactly. Yep. Looking forward to seeing you next week, Charlie. Thank you so much for your time here today. Yeah. And uh, make sure you guys go get uh, Charlie's book right away. Thanks so, so much for having me on. I totally appreciate it. Thanks, Charlie. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. All right. Yeah. I, uh, I, I kept thinking of all these things I wanted to ask him, but the time was growing short, I know. so I, I got to have you back on. <laughs> yeah, I was I was like holding my tongue too. I'm like, oh, we can talk about this. I'm like, oh, no, no, we don't got time for that. But that's cool. That that means we'll have Charlie back soon. So there we go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. You know, I, I was uh, at at the DAC show. I was uh, uh, sitting at lunch chatting with Charlie, and he was telling me I, I can't even remember now what what the story was. I'm like. All these years I've known you, I've never heard that story before. <laughs> so it's just kind of like how I surprise you sometimes, uh, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I thought you only had eight stories. So hold on. <laughs> over and over and over. Over and over. And, over. Um, and, and Jerry, sorry we uh, missed your question there, but uh, we, we just didn't have time to get to it. Uh, good question. She asks, uh, how do we introduce new creative products to resistant clients? So, uh, you know, uh, Charlie might have uh, some feedback on that, but uh, you might want to reach out to him directly. Yeah, just head over to email. his website there. Yep, <laughs> yep. Dr. Print at AOL.com. There you go. Exactly. All right, Terry, what do you does, uh, have does coming it make up here? sound when you, when you send an email to Charlie that... Uh, yeah, it does. <laughs> yep, it does. It makes the, the connection sound, and then it says, you've got mail. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Terry. What do you got coming up here? All right, uh, my complete screen printing business course. Uh, Charlie's talking about teaching new people. Uh, I'm at Workhorse Products in Phoenix, September 23rd and 24th. Unfortunately, that class is completely sold out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be back in Chicago with Atlas Screen Supply on November 4th and 5th. Uh, I'm actually back in Phoenix, December 9th and 10th, if you're we're looking to come to that class. Uh, Impressions Expo in Fort Worth next week. I'll be presenting every, and, and again, what Charlie was saying, everything you've heard about DTG and DTF printing on the internet is wrong. And I'll be moderating a panel discussion with Mel Lay, Stan Banks, and Zach Acorn. Uh, September 20th, Jay, uh, Jay Bissell and I, actually it's 21st, uh, I have that down wrong, uh, we'll be hosting uh, an Equipment Zone webinar called DTG Days. It's been nearly 20 years, so we're bringing together a host of guests to talk about the start, the middle, and where we're going with DTG printing. And you can sign up free at EquipmentZone.com. You guys will be able to see uh, Aaron Montgomery there as well. And uh, watch for all my upcoming events at TerryCombs.com. How about you, Aaron? Yeah, so uh, excited um, to see everybody out in Fort Worth. Uh, I just actually was getting some texts from uh, from my friends at Magic Touch and Corel Trainer right now. Uh, they they did some testing of the printing and stuff that we're doing, and it looks really freaking good. So um, <laughs> exciting stuff. So if you're you want to come check that out, uh, we're doing the ABCs, a uh, design, print, and market. And again, it's with Magic Touch, Corel Trainer, and the good folks at Creo. It is a full day workshop on September 13th, which is the day before the show. So you got to get there a little bit early. <clears throat> if you just head over to osg.link forward slash ABCs. That will take you where you can go to <clears throat> just register for the show and then add that workshop to uh, to to your show registration. Um, 
the week after that, when I get back, we're going to be diving into the five keys of marketing. And uh, this is happening September 18th through the 22nd. Uh, this is a, a program that we do for OSG members annually. Uh, it really just gives them a really great boost to get their fourth quarter where they're just crushing it because they've really thought ahead about how they're going to stand out from the crowd. And um, we, we basically put together a 12-week roadmap and marketing plan that is catered to your business. Um, we do have a full workbook and, and plenty of support. And uh, so, like I said, OSG members get that. But if you want to join and are not an OSG member, if you just go to oursuccessgroup.com forward slash five keys marketing, uh, you can register there. And then um, last but not least, I, I just am really excited about my book that uh, getting getting to the publishing stage, but I do have it out there as an ebook and um, and people can pre-order it. It's called The Fundamentals of Business Success, and I'm, I'm getting some rave reviews on it. So I really appreciate people taking the time to check it out and, and tell me what they think and um so if you would like to get a copy, go over to oursuccessgroup.com forward slash FBS book. So that's what I've got going on. Um, I'll share what Eric's got going on. And then so that way Eric can also get prepared to uh, jump in with this. I can see him cooking in the background there. He's got the, the, sauce, is, <laughs> the sauce is stirring. Um, <laughs> all right. For, to, for Eric today, he's got the take up episode 168. It's going to be embroidery digitizing debate. There's going to be a debate. This sounds awesome. Uh, drawing tools, nodes, and art. So in this episode, he's going to talk about some of the common digitizing debates. So, over the way we create shapes for our work and what it means to design quality from the types of tools we use on screen to the number of nodes in a shape to the way we work from prepared art. We'll talk about the pros and cons of various digitizing methods and which one predicts success. So if you want to head over to ericcampbell.com and click on the take up tab at the top for the links and uh, you can join him live today at 2.30 Mountain Standard Time. Is that right? Daylight. Uh, okay. Uh, 2.30 Mountain Time. We'll just go with that. <laughs> 3.30 center, Central Time. That's even better. But anyhow, um, join him there and uh, you can uh, uh, check out past episodes and all that stuff from ericcampbell.com. Eric is also going to be, so we're going to have the whole whole band out there. I think uh, Dane's going to be out there too. All the all the folks that we know and love are going to be at Impressions Expo coming up here. And he's going to be presenting Embroidery's Value Proposition yeah, Thursday, the next morning after um, the morning of the first day of the show at 9 a.m. Central Time, local time there. So impressionsexpo.com to check that out. Terry, are you hungry? You ready for a little secret sauce? I, I am ready for some secret sauce and ready to hear from our good friend, Eric. <music> folks uh i am here to give you the secret sauce about resizing embroidery designs and the first thing i'm going to let you guys know is resizing is risky embroidery designs are meant to be run at their original size with embroidery's physical limits the best course of action is to create designs at near at or near their intended size when possible uh, depending on the finished size digitizer may make different choices about how to render a design and though it is possible it's not just safe within 10 or 25 percent every design have has different requirements based on the image and how it was interpreted. So even so, there are some times you need to resize and there's some things we can think about when you must rescale a design. Number one, especially if you're working with an outside digitizer, uh, you need to get working files. What working files are, are the native files that the design was digitized with. So it contains the original objects. If you have the same software as that digitizer, you can open the original working or native file. And when you rescale it, uh, though there are some things we still need to look at for that, you are refactoring the stitches based on the original settings and the original shapes that were there. With the shapes there, very much like Vector versus Raster, we rescale that, these shapes maintain original quality, and these stitches are regenerated with the settings that were intended by the digitizer at the specified density. The other thing we need to think about is stitch processing. If you're stuck with a machine file, you'll need software that can either process the design back into objects that can be hit or miss sometimes, it doesn't always recognize them correctly, or software that recognizes stitch types and reprocesses densities. What does this mean? Density is how close together lines of stitching are. If we scale, we can change that and that's going to change our coverage. Otherwise, like I said, if you don't have processing, shrinking increases the density and expanding a design will lower the density in any filled area. 
Be aware that neither of these methods will be as accurate as resizing a working file because textures can sometimes change and some objects or stitch types may not be accurately recognized or regenerated when working from a stitch file. The things we need to take into account when we're looking at a design to say, will this resize successfully or not, are these. The longest stitch. Uh, really wide columns or long stitches in general can cause slowdowns in stitching or maybe excessively loose or loopy depending on your application. If your widest column or longest stitch is above 12 millimeters in length, I mean, 12.4 is that magic number where you start getting that double cycle that makes a really slow stitch on your machine. Almost any rescaling above that's gonna end up with really super slow and sometimes problematic stitching, even if the overall design is small. The other thing to look for is the shortest stitch or the smallest gap. For standard 40 weight threads, satin stitch columns are unlikely to be stable or regular when they get under one millimeter. So you generally want any cap in a loop of satins to be at least, uh, you know, 0.8 millimeters wide for any gap. They need to be about that size to stay open. So a hole in a letter, an O, a P, a capital A, they need to be around 0.8 millimeters to stay open reliably on most materials with 40 weight thread. Uh, for transit stitches or locks, you don't really want stitches smaller than 0.4 millimeters. Even in a really large design, if you have stitches or gaps that are that small, you can't go down not even 10% without incurring some of those potential problems with the look or with the execution. If you have text under five millimeters at that 40 weight thread, you need to start looking at whether or not you can shrink it down. You might just not have room no matter how big the design is. And the other one that we don't always take into account is detail density, so the density of the details. Though you can rescale filled objects and have their densities change and recalculate details like shading lines, outlines, any engraving style work that are manually drawn, they don't recalculate how many lines that you drew manually. We can't add detail when we scale up. This means that uh, manual shading will get sparse when you upscale and straight stitch lines will remain the same thickness no matter how we scale. It can either be uh, really sparse when we upscale or if we start to downscale, they get denser and denser as those lines get closer together, meaning that we can cause full coverage in areas that were supposed to be lightly shaded. So in detail areas, you may not really be able to scale without absolutely changing the look and the finished look of the design, the thickness of lines and the density of detail. In short, uh, resizing designs is not just about a percentage of change that's possible. It's about understanding the way embroidery works, knowing the files and the tools that you need, and looking at what you can compromise on for the original look without requiring you to redigitize the elements, change stitch types, or do something else drastic to get that required size. Sometimes the best resizing option is just redigitizing the work at the proper scale rather than resizing at all. <music>
You can also interact with us over at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash two regular guys, or send us a tweet, twitter.com slash two regular guys. And we have a YouTube page. You can find all that from our website, two regular guys.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to spending some time with you again next week.